welcome everyone. We are so pleased that you are joining us today for Network 2020's briefing on Beijing's expanding economic orbit, where we will take a look at China's Belt and Road Initiative with two experts, Jennifer Hillman and Jude Moore. Before we begin, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I just wanted to say a few words about Network 2020. So we are an inclusive international community and we're focused on bridging the gap between the private sector and the foreign policy community. We do a number of different programs. Uh, please do check out our website and social media for more information. And we will have a replay of this event available on our YouTube channel, uh, probably later on today or tomorrow. So China's BRI, it is an expansive endeavor. It is one that is part economic, also seemingly part public diplomacy, and it has implications for countries worldwide, regardless of whether they are participating. The project spans the globe from Asia to Africa, to Europe, to Latin, Amer to Latin America. And today we're going to take a closer look at the BRI with Jude Moore and Jennifer Hillman. I'm so pleased that both of you are joining us today. Thank you. Um, uh, Jude, I believe we are, we are up first, is um, he is a senior policy fellow at the Center for Global Development, and he focuses on governance, the financing of infrastructure, and Africa's response to the changing landscape of external actors, particularly China. So he's very well suited uh, to talk today, particularly given the fact that he had a position in the government as the Liberia's Minister of Public Works. We are also joined by Jennifer Hillman. Uh, Jennifer is a senior fellow for trade and international political economy at the Council on Foreign Relations, where she specializes in U.S. trade policy, the law and politics of the World Trade Organization, international organizations, and Brexit. In that capacity, I believe she is also an author and a lead on the uh, Council on Foreign Relations Task Force report, which we will um, which we will mention later on as well, and hopefully we can pop a link to that into um, into the chat. So welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's really an honor to have you. And, and can you hear me okay? I heard that someone's losing my feed. So are you able to hear me? Okay, great, good. Um, so Jennifer, I wanted to start with you just for a little bit of context. Next year, the BRI will be 10 years old. What has China achieved in the last decade and how, how has the BRI developed over time? Well, it's a great question and thank you very much for having me here. I mean, I think it's clear that China has achieved a number of the key goals that it had when it started the Belt and Road Initiative in the first place. I mean, one of the key goals for China was to find a home for a lot of the excess manufacturing capacity that it had put in place, particularly manufacturing coming out of its state-owned enterprises. Uh, so if you think steel, aluminum, chemicals, a whole number of those items, uh, China has excess capacity. It needed to find a place to sell those goods. So one of the things that it was able to do with BRI was to, was to again, offload a lot of that excess capacity into these BRI partner countries. It was also able to use the Belt and Road Initiative to secure a steady, consistent supply of a lot of the input materials that its manufacturing sector needs by, again, getting my access to mines and minerals and specific you know, again, input materials that it needs um, in its BRI countries uh, with a kind of one-way road pipeline of, of those goods going, going into China. It was also able to set technology standards in a number of foreign countries that give Chinese companies sort of a leg up in those markets. I would say, you know, one of the big goals that China had is one that you see it being able to achieve, which is to reorient global commerce away from the United States and Western Europe toward China uh, through the creation of new trade routes and much more sort of efficient transportation networks. Think ports, railroads, roads, uh, with all networks sort of ending up sort of hubbing in and around China. Um, the other thing that it's been able to do is to become a major creditor to the developing world. Again, you now have, as you said, you know, countries all over the world that are participants in the Belt and Road Initiative are now on the hook for very, very substantial loans uh, to China. And China has been able to then accrue the leverage that comes with um, all of these countries being indebted in China 
to exert pressure on a lot of them. Don't challenge China on strategic issues. Don't say anything about human rights in, in Xinjiang. Um, don't comment on what's going on in Hong Kong or Taiwan or Chinese domestic politics. So it's been able to use the leverage created by BRI to, to do a lot of that. And I would say lastly, um, you know, China has been able to use the Belt and Road Initiative to acquire sort of global intelligence capabilities, um, you know, throughout the world, whether that is because they are selling so much smart grid technology, so much artificial intelligence, so much telecommunications technology, so and owning or controlling so many ports where undersea cables come up out of the port, um, you know, uh, where we have a huge amounts of data being moved on those. So again, a lot of that. So to me, th those are the kind of significant achievements that China has has obtained. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. One one follow up to that. Um, obviously, you mentioned infrastructure a lot, which is, I think, what comes to mind when people think about the BRI. Um, but you also mentioned very briefly the idea of standards, um, which I think ties into something else, which is um, technology. Um, so how does how does China's um, focus on technology impact the BRI, including fintech? How does that factor in? Well, again, it's to me, it's it's one of the huge things to sort of appreciate about how how the Belt and Road Initiative has changed over time. Again, it clearly started out with this big focus on hard infrastructure. Again, that is the ports, the roads, the electricity grids, power plants, and it has clearly morphed um, and, and completely pivoted in a very substantial way away from that hard infrastructure towards, I would say, two key items, te technology generally, meaning mostly telecommunications, uh, this is again 5G technology being installed all over Africa, all over many parts of Asia. Um, it is um, financial technology, meaning largely electronic payment systems and other parts of that fintech space, the development of its own blockchain network um, that is part and parcel of some of that, that fintech network and a pivot to a so-called health silk road, meaning health technology, global health. So you've now seen the great development of this digital silk road, as well as a health silk road um, that have not completely displaced, but are, are sort of becoming much more important. Part of the reason is why. Um, China is clearly finding out that building a lot of this hard infrastructure is extremely expensive. And many of those projects have, uh, have had huge problems with debt defaults, or potential defaults, um, and and with COVID, uh, again, a lot of the labor that has gone into producing these roads and, and ports, et cetera, has been Chinese labor that has been sent from China to those places. And as COVID grew, um, China's ability to send labor abroad diminished. And so again, uh, many reasons, but it's clear uh, that, that a couple of things. One, the Belt and Road is here to stay. It may not be as focused on on infrastructure, but it is now part of the Chinese constitution. It is Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy measure. It is not going to, to go away, but it is, I think, going to be much more focused on, again, technology writ large and, and this uh, global health space uh, than it was in the past. Wonderful, thank you. Jude, turning to you. As a former member of the Liberian government, you have on the ground experience in infrastructure development. So how have you seen the Belt and Road Initiative take shape outside of China? And what impact have you seen it have on Liberia and elsewhere in Africa? Thank you, Courtney. And thanks for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, pleasure being here. I think first you just step back for a minute and, and, and establish some context. One is that uh, of all the regions in the world, Africa lags every other region when it comes to the availability and functionality of infrastructure. We're talking electricity. Um, almost 600 million people lack access to electricity in Africa. Right? 300 million people are more than 50 kilometers away from any installation of cables for internet. And so because of that, there's a huge absence of infrastructure there. But if you follow the development dialogue and discourse sometime in the 1970s, the U.S. began to step away from building hard infrastructure and focus on, on, on health, on, on education. 
And because the US exerts such significant influence, whether it's at the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, or elsewhere, that change in US policy began to be reflected in multilateral development lending. So by the time China comes on the scene, there is a huge infrastructure gap that, that, that is not being met. In fact, the B3W, that the White House new infrastructure thing that is introducing, uses the number $40 trillion as the, the gap in infrastructure financing. In Africa, that gap is anywhere from, it could go from 68 to $108 billion a year in terms of what is missing. And so I think it's important to establish that that, 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 that context in terms of what Africa needed. When the Chinese first showed up in Africa, um, as um, Jennifer noted, they wanted access to infrastructure at source, right? They could buy it on the market, but they wanted control of the mines, they wanted that. And for many African countries for the first time, the Chinese introduced this model of infrastructure for uh, resources. So basically, China will extend you an infrastructure loan built by a Chinese company against the, the, the earnings of natural resource extraction in your country. And this may not have been the ideal, but for the average African in, a, African in a lot of countries, this was the first time they could make a direct connection between the extraction of a natural resource and, and clear public benefit for them. So the, the Chinese go out and, and, and I think another thing that made China really attractive beyond the need that, that most African countries had was this idea of non-interference. You have to remember that with World Bank intervention, the US or the EU intervention, they demand policy reforms in government as an exchange for, for uh, um, assistance. So for example, we want better public financial management, reduction in corruption, those kinds of demands are made. Whereas the Chinese were like, those things are clearly uh, internal things and we have absolutely nothing to do with that. As long as we can get a sovereign guarantee from your government, we will build the infrastructure. We are not going to condition our engagement based on that. And for a continent which at the time was populated by a lot of autocrats, you can imagine how happy they were to deal with the, uh, deal with the Chinese. So I think the, the question remains, and, and the final thing I would say is that beyond the hard infrastructure, beyond, it's almost like 100,000 kilometers of roads, uh, more than 6,000 kilometers of rail, more than 80 ports, a huge hospital and water treatment facilities, infrastructure that ordinarily probably would not have been built in Africa if it weren't for the presence of the Chinese. Obviously, none of this stuff is altruistic. It comes at a cost, right? But I think for most African governments, you're weighing the cost in not having the infrastructure at all or having what the Chinese produce and giving up something really valuable in exchange for that. And the final thing that I would say on that is there has been an evolution that you're seeing more and more now in the tech space. And China is involved at every level. First, from the undersea cables to the, the components in terms of, I think there was a statistic that showed a 70% of the 4G network in Africa was built on Huawei components. But Chinese operating systems now, like Harmony and Opera, are payment systems. So the entire technology stack is being built by China. And, and the reason why most countries turned to China again was because, for example, for uh, um, 5G, you had Ericsson and you had, um, oh, okay. well, Ericsson and someone else were, were the two competitors. But Huawei is normally on average about 25% with comparable quality. And so in a, in a market, that is price sensitive, where everything is determined by how, how expensive or how cheap it is, you can imagine why a, a Chinese option was very, very attractive. Terrific, thank you. Um, Jennifer, in the 2021 report, uh, the task force report of the Council on Foreign Relations, which I believe Brian has dropped a link to in the chat, um, you raised, or the report raised several concerns about the BRI, including the undermining effects it has on market competition, economic stability, environmental conditions, and social standards. So what are the main risks of the BRI for participating countries and the global economy? Well, I'll just start with, you know, again, I think the problem for the United States and the rest of the world is not the existence of the Belt and Road Initiative itself. Again, I, I would certainly agree with everything Judy has just said. Part of the reason why the Belt and Road Initiative 
got as far as it did is because China was filling a vacuum uh, that the United States and others had created. We had and largely, and to some degree, the multilateral development banks and others had largely walked away from funding a lot of this hard infrastructure. So, and again, China, it's not the existence of the Belt and Road because it is definitely providing um, very much needed um, infrastructure in many places. The problem for the United States, and I think for the rest of the world, is the way in which China is going about it. And again, I'm going to just cite a couple of things that are particularly worrying. First is that it is undermining macroeconomic stability because it is increasing the likelihood that a debt crisis is going to materialize over the coming years because so many of these loans are at you know on commercial terms carrying you know relatively high interest rates um, into countries that are already relatively impoverished and they're funding fairly economically questionable projects um, that may or may not end up you know creating or generating much return at least not for many many years to come so that's one clear concern the second one is obviously that china is now subsidizing very privileged market access for its own state-owned and, and sort of non-market-oriented Chinese companies, which means it will be triply hard for US and other companies to try to come in and compete with those um, because they're not gonna be able to match either the speed or the price. Um, they may be better on quality on a lot of other things, but there's a real concern about this degree of market access. Thirdly, it has definitely been able to allow China to lock countries into these kind of Chinese ecosystems uh, particularly by pressing its technology and these preferred technical standards on all of these BRI recipients. I mean, it used to be in the telecommunications area. It was a little bit of kind of plug and play. You could buy one component from one place and another component from another, and you could build your own telecommunication systems. No longer. I mean, the standards are very much Huawei and ZTE standards. So you again locked others out and made it clear that it's not reliance on, on China just for the first installation. You are you are locking yourself into sticking with that Chinese ecosystem for you know sort of a very long time. You know, I think the other one was the other sort of issue of concern that was raised was uh, the degree to which one of the things in the power sector that China did was to export. 260 coal-fired power plants. Uh, again, plants that sh are likely to stay online for 30, 40 years. So again, it has made um, each country's dependence on carbon-intensive power you know, more significant, making it much harder for climate change mitigation to really take place. And I think uh, Judy touched on one of the other issues. It is clearly making it harder for the World Bank and other traditional lenders to insist on the high standards that they typically do insist on in terms of transparency, good governance, environmental impact assessments, you know, a whole series of rigorous environmental and social impact assessments are completely being ignored and it makes it harder now for the World Bank to come back in and ask for those high standards if everyone can turn to China. You know, and again, and lastly is the comment that I sort of touched on earlier, it does leave countries more susceptible to Chinese political pressure um, because of the dominant Chinese presence in these markets. So those are among the sort of concerns that get raised. And at the same time, they get raised in this context of understanding that China is filling a tremendous need out there in the world and a need that we and others ha ha had not been willing or able to fill. Thank you. Um, zooming out a little bit, Jude, you had mentioned the, uh, and this kind of picks up on Jennifer's and your earlier point about, about that vacuum. Will this Build Back Better World program, the, B, the, the B3W um, by the US or the EU's global gateway, will they offer alternatives to the BRI countries in years to come? Are, they, are these seen as um, really viable competitors or not? Possibly. Uh, I mean, uh, for now, they're, they're just ideas. They're policy positions. We haven't seen them backed by real resources. We haven't seen them in any projects. I just want to go back a little bit to some of the things that Jennifer said, and, and this really is true. But I think if you step back a bit, it is also normal that, for example, what France lost in the, the submarine deal to Australia wasn't simply supplying submarines. 
It was supplying parts and servicing. Every seller of infrastructure also sells the post sales maintenance and services that come with that, right? And so you're trying to lock your client in so that they keep coming back. And I want to point this out because a lot of people don't know that before up to 2018, but, uh, when the Trump administration uh, moved against it, 25% of the components for US rural uh, telecommunications companies were built by Huawei. Huawei was actually a non-voting member of the Rural Telecommunications Association here in the US, simply because it was cost, it was cheaper. This uh, US telecoms providers were facing the same things you face in Africa. They had vast areas over which they had to provide service without a lot of people and the density to pay for it. So they went for the cheapest one. And so I think the Chinese have, have played that really, really well in terms of locking in a certain kind of infrastructure or component to be able to. I think though that in a way, China has won the argument <laughs> with uh, the West. And the argument was that we need to finance infrastructure because Global Gateway and B3W are always presented as alternatives to what the Chinese are doing. And you have to remember that if, if they had been financing infrastructure from the beginning, there wouldn't have been even space for the Chinese to arise and do that. So that's a good thing. The second thing is that we're going to see, and we're beginning to see that. So for example, before the war started in Ethiopia, there was a big sale in licenses. And there were two, two main competitors for those licenses. One was MTN out of South Africa, and MTN was backed by the, uh, the Silk Road Fund from China. And one was Vodafone out of Kenya, and it was backed by the USDFC. So all of a sudden, we're beginning to see a competition now in terms of providing financing that did not exist before. If that had occurred, say, I don't know, five years ago, it would have simply been the Chinese component that would be there. But now we have real competition for that. We're also seeing that US firms are now building data centers across Africa. Initially, a lot of that stuff was being done by Huawei, but we're seeing Raxio, we're seeing Digital Realty, we're seeing Equinix, huge US firms taking large positions in data. And so, and, and the final thing is almost every African tech uh, uh, unicorn has used US VCs. Right, it's U.S. money going into them that that, that gave them that valuation. So I think B3W and 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 Global Gateway can be competitors in certain sectors, and we're already beginning to see that. And that is a good problem to have. As an African, I want to be able to go to the market for money to finance and have to compete and have three competing infrastructure financing funds out of which I can and I can pit them against each other and get what's best. So I think it's a good start. Hopefully we will see some announcements soon of real physical projects. All right. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And it's it's interesting. I think your point about the about the service and the contracts is one that, that's particularly important and sort of absent, I mean, I, I suppose you answered it this at the end, but absent any concrete plans for B3W right now. Um, and, and I remember hearing this when, when Network 2020 went to Iran in 2014, this is you know, pre-JCPOA, uh, is that there was an interest in having U.S. companies be there because of that servicing, because of that long-term customer service agreement. Is that something that you're hearing? Is that what is wanted? Or is it simply, you know, we would just like to be able to, to you know, have a few proposals at our fingertips? So... I think U.S. companies bring a certain value to any economy they enter. And the first one is that every U.S. company operating overseas is subject to FCPA rules, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And so every U.S. company is, is required to behave in, in foreign markets as they would in the U.S. market because they could be prosecuted here. So I don't know if there's a Chinese equivalent, for FCPA, I know there's a European one. I know that sometime in 2018, Chinese anti-corruption rules were being applied to the BRI. I don't know how extensively those rules are being applied. I think this is a really, really good thing. The second thing also is like, even for Huawei, Huawei still has to depend on US and Western technology for its chips, right? And, and so the, we saw how the Trump administration by cutting Huawei off from US technology basically killed the company. So China is able to produce and provide really high quality products in certain areas, but that doesn't obviate the need for high quality products that come from the US system. And so because of that, a lot of companies 
want the balance. They want access to both European and American products and, and as well as the Chinese one. Thank you. Can, okay. can I, could I just add a couple other sure. things? Because I, I would totally agree with all of that. And, and some of obviously the dilemma for the United States is, you know, they're in this position of saying to everyone, don't use Huawei because we're worried about its connections to the Communist Party and we're worried that it could be, but we don't have 5G. I mean, so we don't have an alternative to offer. I mean, all we can say is please go to Nokia, Ericsson or Samsung. You know, so part of what has to happen is, and again, I think this is kind of the message behind some of the Build Back Better and the, and the Build Back Better world is we've got to develop our own, you know, ability to offer up technology. Uh, we've missed the boat, uh, you know, and again, so some of it is looking at, you know, where was China able to fill some voids where the United States stopped doing the kind of R&D and investing? And it's not just, you know, in telecommunications. Um, we don't build high-speed rail. That's one of the big, you know, sort of needs. I mean, there you got to go, you know, to Japan and Europe or, again, China or Korea. Um, you, you look at the production of solar, wind, energy, uh, solar and wind energy. I mean, who is the number one provider? By far, it is China, by far. Um, you know, electronic payments platforms, um, the development of high, you know, ultra high voltage transmission systems. So again, it's technology after technology where you look at it and say part of what I think the Biden administration is clearly saying is we get it, that we have to have a competitive alternative. And that's going to take a lot of investing in our own research and development at home to make America more competitive. It is going to take more coalition building. I mean, I think you saw that when you know, the Biden administration announced this partnership with Europe under this Trade and Technology Council. A lot of that, again, is to say, okay, we also have to partner with Europe. You see that in some of this Indo-Pacific area to partner with Japan and Australia and India to try to, you know, come into these markets. The other thing that I would add is one of the other reasons and ways in which I think the United States is now, the Biden administration is trying to really figure out how do we push back? How do we have a legitimate alternative to offer? Is to try to understand what's gone right and what's gone wrong with the Belt and Road Initiative. And one of the other things that you're clearly hearing from many of the BRI partners that they object to is the lack of skills transfer. Again, almost all of these facilities are heavily constructed by Chinese labor or certainly the management, the engineering, et cetera, is largely by Chinese uh, laborers that have been in management and executives that have been moved to do these pro projects. And there is almost no skills transfer in many of these projects. So now you have a power plant, but you cannot operate it or fix it without, again, significant amount of Chinese management present. And what the United States is trying to say is over the long term to many of these countries, look at an alternative um, that would give you legitimate skills transfer and teaching of skills that would be financed in a way that is actually affordable, is transparent, and is open. Because that is one of the other ways and one of, the, one of the other things that's being learned about the Belt and Road Initiative where you're seeing a lot of pushback. And that is the terms of these loans, uh, which are unusual. I mean, this is something different that China has done. I mean, first they have the most stringent secrecy clauses of, of any kind of international development lending. I mean, you are not supposed to reveal anything at all about these loans. And so again, what we know is there was a leak, if you will, and there was about 100 loan contracts that were for very few minutes in time publicly available, downloaded, and now have been really studied and examined. And what they tell you is, A, huge amounts of secrecy. B, everyone has to agree to these clauses that effectively say, I won't go to the Paris Club or any other international support to try to help me if I have to renegotiate the loan. I will not do that. I pledge that I won't. Many of them require countries to set up secret offshore bank accounts to make sure that China is the first creditor in line. China is the first one that gets paid to the extent that a loan goes bad. Um, and a lot of them have very kind of unusual cross defaults provisions and other things that in essence just privilege China in these loans. And so one of the things I think that the Biden administration has clearly recognized that they need to do is to try to get in right up front before a, a BRI project has been put in place to say to that country, let us come in and at least 
give you some technical assistance. Let us come in and at least help you value the project. I mean, China is asking you to pay X. Is it really worth X? For example, we did this in, in one, one of the ports in Myanmar and the original were able to basically knock out you know, 75% of the cost by saying you are overpaying. Uh, you know, you, you need to make sure that you're getting good value for the money. So one of the things that I think is likely to become very effective um, uh, in, in the Biden administration's Build Back Better World is this idea of getting a good technical team in early on in the project to help value it, price it, make sure that the loan terms are more transparent and are more within a traditional sort of lending model, make sure that environmental impact assessments are, are done or are, are taken into account, make sure that there are provisions for skills transfer. So in that sense, I think you, you, you're likely to see some, some changes in the way in which at least the United States and others are pushing China to improve the way in which it governs its BRI projects. Thank you, Jennifer. And you largely answered my question about how Washington is responding. And we are getting a lot of questions from the Q&A. So I just want to um, send one more over to you, Jude, and then I'll turn to the Q&A box. Um, and so Jude, when, when Jennifer started talking, she was talking about how the infrastructure project then morphed into technology and health. I'm curious to get your perspective. How have you seen the BRI impact other aspects of cooperation between China and some of the countries in the continent over time? Um, is, it, is it just BRI or are there other aspects that we should be aware of? I think so far as Africa is concerned, Chinese presence in Africa and Chinese investment in Africa um, was pretty substantive before the BRI was introduced. In fact, the primary mechanism of Chinese investment in Africa is FOCAC, is the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. So at FOCAC is, heard, is held every three years and China announces, okay, over the next three years, we're gonna invest you know, 60 billion, we're gonna invest 40 billion. And, and so that's, that's, for example, at the last FOCAC, which was held recently, China has promised that over the next three years, they will import $300 billion worth of African goods. Right, and they have a pledge. So, so BRI is important because it's the core of foreign policy piece. But in Africa, it's largely been China has been building infrastructure before the introduction of BRI. Now, everything, in, in fact, over time, BRI became largely a label that everything was sort of like a BRI project now and, and being able to do. So, I think that's that's really important. I, I wanted to go back again because this debt issue has come up a, a number of times. And I think there were some African countries that struggled with debt. Uh, um, Zambia defaulted on its loans to private bondholders, and China was a big part of that because Zambia had uh, uh, an, an agreement with China that, that forbade uh, Zambia to reveal the terms of the agreement it had to the private bondholders. And so because of that, the private bondholders refused to give Zambia a deferral because they felt like if they deferred, that deferred payment would then go to China. And so since they didn't know that Zambia defaulted because of that. But I just, I wanted to say also that China is the largest bilateral lender. For example, if, if Liberia or Togo wanted to borrow from the US government, there is really no mechanism for the US to do government to government lending. You might get money through the World Bank or the African Development Bank where the US contributes, but where the US is directly lending to countries, that's something the US has stopped doing for a while. But China, I think between 2019 and 2024, 64% of interest payments to bilateral lenders across the world were going to China. So China was lending to countries with weak credit history. There are only about 33 African sovereigns who have a sovereign rating who can go to the financial markets and issue debt. And so China is lending to these countries with weak credits, right? And so what China ended up doing was building those contracts in such a way that it got repaid. One of them Jennifer spoke about was establishing escrow accounts in banks where China had control. So for example, if, the, if there was a mine that was given in this infrastructure for minerals deal, that mining project would have an escrow account in a Chinese controlled bank. And when payments went, they went to that account first. Right, so these were some stringent means that China put in there, but sometimes they were over the top. For example, the Kenyan government is in court today because activists are suing the Kenyan government 
to show the terms of agreement for the Mombasa rail. And up to today, it hasn't been produced. So I think in a lot of instances, these agreements are not a deal. These agreements will probably, if there were options on the table, most countries would probably ask for a bit different deal. And I think the demand from the Chinese side would be different, but simply because of the absence of this. And, and I'm quickly, before I stop, it's like, between now and mid-century, half of the 2 billion increase in global population is expected to occur in Africa. As it stands, the population of the continent is already putting stress on existing infrastructure. Africa is gonna to continue to need infrastructure. And if there is no alternative, then it doesn't matter how crappy the terms are that the Chinese present, that's what's gonna happen. If my house is on fire and my neighbor shows up, I'm not gonna be like, hey, that's dirty water you're using to put out my fire. Like, you know, if he's the only one who shows up to put out the fire, then, then that's what I'm gonna accept. So I think we need alternatives. We need the World Bank and the multilateral development banks to begin to finance infrastructure, hard infrastructure. Again, we need bilaterals to finance hard infrastructure. Thank you. That's a great point. And, and, I, and I hope we can dig into that later on in the Q&A. Um, picking up on one of those points, we have a question in the Q&A box. And Jennifer, I'll direct this to you. Um, and of course, Judy, feel free to jump in if you'd like. Um, uh, the questioner wants to know, do the BRI investments make sense from a financial and business perspective, or is this basically about politics and regional power? I think the vast majority of them probably do make, no, I shouldn't say the vast majority. Clearly, I think the majority makes sense. I mean, they are really building real roads, real railroads, real ports, real telecommunication systems, real power plants. I mean, there are people now across all of these BRI countries that have access to a regular source of electricity that didn't have it before. Um, is that necessary? Yes. I mean, it, you know, is it doing, I mean, you now have you know, rail running all the way from China all the way to London, you know, you have freight rail, again, which is more, you know, again, environmentally uh, uh, sound uh, to move more goods via rail uh, than you've ever had before. So many of the projects are doing, are building roads, you know, again, that are much needed, are building rivers, I, I'm sorry, bridges are are, and, and clearly, you know, in the power sector, you know, you just have a lot of cities that now have power in a way that they didn't before. So was that needed? Yes. Uh, and was the United States and others leaving a vacuum? Yes. Uh, and, you know, Judea is completely right. I mean, there needs to be, the, the, the infrastructure deficit is huge and going to get larger as a result of climate change. We simply are going to need more and different kinds of infrastructure, which is going to require more and more investments. Now, are there some white elephants in these BRI projects? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Uh, you know, and again, you, you look right now, I mean, the railroad that Judy just mentioned, I mean, it's supposed to have run from Mombasa to Nairobi and then on from Nairobi to into Uganda. If you look right now, it just stops. I mean, it just literally stops. So that is like a railroad to nowhere. Um, so, and again, you can go on and on about a number of the projects that are white elephants um, that have either not been finished um, that make no sense economically, where you're building high-speed rail, where you don't need high-speed rail, uh, et cetera. Uh, but in the main, and again, part of that is, again, the process by which something gets to be a BRI project. I mean, this has been touched on a little bit, which is what tends to happen is the Chinese companies that want to do that project, they want it to be viewed as a BRI project because then they come under the sort of good graces, if you will, of Xi Jinping. They get better concessional financing from the Chinese Exim Bank and others if they are viewed as a BRI project. The moment the project starts to go south, the Chinese tend to say, oh, that wasn't a BRI project, that somehow it becomes something else. So again, a little bit of it is playing with the naming of whether something is BRI or not. A little bit of it is whatever, but I think the, the the track record on the BRI projects is a bit mixed. I mean, they've all done something, they, you know, most of them have, uh, have been doing something that was needed, some of them not, but again, they have the downsides that I've talked about in terms of the way in which the lending is done, the way in which there's no skills transfer, and the environmental damage. I mean, those are the kind of key things that you would say are negatives against most of the BRI projects. Great, thank you, Jennifer. We're getting a lot of questions about debt. And so I'm going to turn to you, Judah, with this one. Um, and the questioner asks, 
what evidence is there to date that countries partnering with China in BRI projects become enmeshed in debt beyond their capability to manage independently, and that most of the benefits of these projects ultimately are realized by China alone and not their partners? Yeah. Um, so uh, examples. I think that's a really good, I think that's a really good question. And I want to focus on the region of the world where I have concentrated my studies. When we speak of Chinese debt to Africa, it's usually in aggregate. But it's important to understand that almost 90% of Chinese debt to the entire continent and its 54 countries is concentrated in about seven countries, right? Of those seven countries, close to a, to a quarter of that debt is just one country, Angola. If you were to remove Chinese debt to Angola, if you were to remove Chinese debt to um, Congo, Zambia, Kenya, Africa looks like, and so in the end, China's contribution to debt in Africa is somewhere between 20 to 23%. The troubling rise in debt in Africa is not really the one to the Chinese, it's the one to the private sector. It's this Eurobond debt that the African governments are issuing. Why is that a problem? If there is a, prop, a, a risk of debt default, an African country can negotiate with China. That's a single actor you can negotiate repayment with. But how do you negotiate with hedge fund managers, with pension funds who've bought your debt? There are thousands of people who bought your Eurobond debt, and it's almost impossible to get them in one room and be able to resolve the debt issue. So the growing segment of Africa's debt, troubling segment of African debt, isn't actually the debt to China. Now, there are some African countries that are overwhelmingly in debt to China. For example, Djibouti, almost 70% of Djibouti's debt is to China alone. So there are uh, 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 single stories of, of, of countries where the presence of Chinese debt contributes to debt distress, but there is not a single country in Africa where it's, that is on the, the brink of debt distress or that is actually in debt distress simply because of what the Chinese have done. However, as I noted in the Zambia case, China's insistence on the secrecy of its debt terms, even with those countries, sometimes has an impact. And that is what, what contributed to the default that we saw in, in, in Zambia. So again, China's debt in Africa is about 20%. It's really weird that we will concentrate so much time talking about the 20% and not talking about the 80% that is owed to other actors, right? Um, and, 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 and then again, it is concentrated in a few countries. The final thing I would say on the debt question is that because Africa has such low savings, it means that the finance this infrastructure, the continent repeatedly has to look externally. That external thing can come either as a grant or as a loan. So if that, that loan didn't come from China, it would come from somewhere else. Now, if there were possible better loan options on the table, as I noted again, they wouldn't turn to the Chinese for it. So what are African governments supposed to do? Just watch your population grow without infrastructure or take loans from China to be able to do that. I think finally, the reason if we talk about debt distress in Africa is because of the structure of international trade. 70% of African exports to the EU in 2020 were unprocessed raw materials. Over 60% of African imports from the EU 27 were finished goods. So as long as Africa is bringing in things of value and shipping out things of less value, how is it gonna be able to service its debt? So let's talk about what the, China, the role that China is playing in this, but let's talk about China, Africa's trade relations with the rest of the world that puts it in a position that makes it difficult for us to service its debt. So those are my comments on that. I'd only add just really quickly, uh, for those that are really interested, I mean, in this Council on Foreign Relations report, we try to examine this question of whether the Belt and Road Initiative is really designed as a debt trap. I mean, the sort of classic sort of allure a country in and when they can't repay, you seize their property or their assets that you now uh, control as yours. And at least the council report suggests that that is really not what's happening. Uh, an awful lot of exactly what's happening is exactly what Jude said. I mean, and we looked at you know, the prime example everybody cites when they say, oh, the Belt and Road is this terrible debt trap, is the takeover of a particular port in Sri Lanka. The, you know, and uh, what the report says is, you know, the, the, the conditions around that were really sui generis to that particular port. And yes, China did end up with a 99-year lease where it is controlling this particular port in Sri Lanka, very significant port, you know, for a lot of reasons because of where that port is situated. But nonetheless, um, it was not in the view of, of, of those of us involved in this task force, 
um, an indication of, of BRI being designed to trap countries into turning over their assets to China. Great, thank you for that addition. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to direct this next question to you. Um, and the questioner asks, um, or they start off by stating, when I participated in an IoT Internet of Things conference in Wuxi, and apologies for my pronunciation, I noticed that Chinese participants in uh, setting global standards or, or, or they were participating more in setting global standards. And, and they've um, started to make new standards recommendations, which other members felt were good and therefore accepted them. Do you think this is happening throughout the BRI? Yes, absolutely, yes. And, and this is one of the things that, um, that this report comments on. And, and that is that, again, Chinese standards are becoming the global standards. And they're doing that in two ways. I mean, one is they're basically flooding the zone. I mean, if all of the 5G tech technology in Africa is Huawei and, and ZTE technology, guess what? That technology and those tech standards just become dominant by, by virtue of market share. The other way in which they are really becoming the global standard setters is they are very much more uh, actively involved in the international standard setting organizations. If you look, for example, at the International Telecommunications Union, which is one of the big standard setting organizations in the telecom space, and you just look at the number of proposals for standards um, in like 5G, China submitted over 20,000 proposals for standards in that space. The United States, 1,000. You know, so again, we're just not participating in any way, shape, or form at the same sort of level, depth, et cetera. If you look at now who is leading all of the key committees in the International Telecommunications Union, those are all Chinese nationals. And if you then step back and say, how does this happen? Part of it is, again, the government of China is encouraging even funding, giving tax breaks, supporting significant Chinese participation in, and again, it's not just the ITU. I mean, it's the Codex Alimentarius that's setting food standards. It's on and on and on. The, the, the major international standard setting organizations, if you look across them, they are being increasingly sort of run and, and you know, significantly influenced by a much, much more robust Chinese presence. And again, this is where we're just we walked away. I mean, we, we've left a vacuum. China has come in and filled it. Thank you. Um, Jude, we're getting a couple questions here that, that I'll, I'll try to parse into one. Um, and, the, and, and the questioners are asking about uh, other strategic components of the BRI and the potential to use host countries for military purposes. Is this something, is this part of the conversation that, that you're hearing? Um, in, in uh, Liberia or elsewhere? Well, this has come up, right? So I think for, for foreign policy and people involved in foreign policy, we a lot of this infrastructure is dual use. It's largely, so for example, a port. It's, it's for civilian use. It's to be able to bring in goods and services, but it can also be used for military. So a Chinese ship can make, make it a port of call. A Chinese ship can come in there and be able to establish this. It's also... When China built the AU headquarters, there was this report that you know the equipment there was sending information back to headquarters in China every night, and it became this huge thing. And both the AU and the Chinese tried to squash that. So yeah, I, I think um, the dual use nature of of a lot of the infrastructure lends itself to that, and 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 so there's a possibility for that. The second thing is we we now have the first Chinese overseas based um, um, military base in Djibouti. And, and there is a possibility that we might see the second one in Africa in the Gulf of Guinea, because the reason, at least the justification, the proximate justification for the base in, in Djibouti was piracy in the Gulf of Aden. And we're seeing increased piracy in the Gulf of Guinea. So it's possible too that we might get a Chinese uh, port there. However, that doesn't come anywhere near the number of US bases anywhere, everywhere in the world, right? So there's that. I think here's what's happening. It's important for us to keep this in mind when we have this conversation that since 1945, there has been a system built on the, Bre the Bretton Woods system of this rules-based international order. And on every hand, we now see a peer competitor that is challenging and imposing and actually trying to introduce new rules. So you have the World Bank where the US dominates. Now you have the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank where China is actually the dominant one. We have the New Development Bank where China is the dominant one this introduction of standards, this introduction of new rules on everything, right? And so there is, there, when there is actually a competition 
to restructure the international system. And China is making a really, really big play for that. Now that, and some countries go along unwittingly, right? You, the, the more, unlike the Soviet Union that basically brought itself behind an iron curtain, China is the largest trade partner of over a hundred countries. China is as enmeshed in the world in the global economy as any other. And so it's not gonna be like the old Cold War in terms of this competition. But there is actually a significant play from China to restructure the international system so that it fits China's goals and interests. Thank you. I'd like to follow up with that um, for with a question for you, Jennifer. It seems like a big theme of today has been um, there's a vacuum, the U.S. isn't there. Uh, Jude just outlined some areas in which there is this competitor, this peer competitor in the international rules-based order, you know, particularly when it comes to things like, say, the World Bank. Um, that's another institution, and, and I'd like to just talk about some of these international institutions like the World Bank, where um, I know that, you know, I'm not up to speed on it, but I know that there have been a lot of issues with, say, pointing um, the appellate court of the World Bank, and, and the U.S. has just been reluctant to do that. So can you talk a little bit about where, where these international institutions are in terms of their ability to show up or not. So Courtney, I think your question uh, referenced the World Bank, but I think you mean the World Trade Organization. Uh, so thank so you, me, thank let, you, I'm at the World Trade Organization, yeah, thank and, you. And again, and, and I, so first of all, I, will, I would simply um, uh, you know, support and applaud and maybe even amplify the points that Judy was making, because I think it is in the, in the rules-based trading system where we see this competition, you know, coming to the fore, you know, much more, more so than perhaps in some other realms. It is in that trade space. Um, and, and this is exactly right. And the problem, I think, for the United States and, and for many others is it is coming at a time in which the World Trade Organization is in, in a state of crisis. Uh, you know, the WTO was created, um, you know, in 1995, it grew out of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade created in 1947, and had its, at its core, this idea that the existence of, of that institution was all about liberalizing trade, meaning opening up other markets to trade and enforcing these rules against discrimination, that you couldn't discriminate as between one member versus another uh, based on their nationality, and that you couldn't discriminate as between an imported product versus a domestically made product. That was kind of the bedrock of the WTO. And it was premised on this notion of market economy. I mean, that prices and supply and demand were the things that were driving these ideas of whether or not there was discrimination occurring was largely a market sort of base notion. Well, now you think about it. Um, a, you know, China is presenting this huge competitive model um, where decisions in China are made by the Communist Party. They are not made on the basis of price, supply, demand, or other market economy conditions, where you have a Communist Party member sitting on the board of virtually every major corporation um, that your companies are starting to find out, well, gee, even though we only have one Communist Party member on our board, if we don't vote the way the Communist Party member wants us to vote, we all of a sudden don't get permits, we don't get licenses. Again, the state just taking an increasingly large role in the Chinese economy. The state-owned enterprises are larger than they've ever been. Xi Jinping is sort of pushing them to merge with one another. You simply see a very different kind of an economy, a very whole different kind of a structure. Then it all comes, you know, sort of to, to, to rest at the WTO at a time in which the institution is weakened. Uh, yes, the Trump administration, you know, blocked any appointments to the WTO's appellate body, effectively it's sort of Supreme Court, it's last court of appeals. What does that mean? That means if you have a dispute, normally it would go to a panel, a panel would decide it. If you wanted to appeal that decision, it went up to the appellate body and that was the final say. And then you were supposed to comply with the decision. Well now, because there is no appellate body, you can get a ruling from a panel and all you need to do if you don't want to comply with the ruling is file an appeal. Because under the WTO rules, nobody is supposed to do anything with that decision. You're not supposed to implement it or try to implement it or retaliate or anything else while an appeal is pending. And as long as we have no members sitting on the appellate body, you know, an appeal is going to is going to be pending forever. So you've basically said, you know, the rules are not any longer binding. All right. You add to that 
this notion that again, there, there was an attempt you know, at the G20 and other places to say, could we at least all agree on what is the sort of raison d'etre of the WTO? And, and again, you start ticking off all of the things and everybody says, yes, agreement, yes, agreement, yes, agreement. When you come to market economy principles, China says, no, we do not agree that that is one of the underlying principles of the WTO. So you now have this huge clash um, at the WTO and again, at a time in which the institution itself is weak. And it's weak in part because it's perceived to be sort of out of balance. I mean, it is supposed to have a negotiating arm, a negotiating forum where new agreements are going to be reached. If you look at in the 25 years that the WTO has been in existence, one new agreement has been reached on trade facilitation. It's an important agreement, but it's one agreement. Um, and it, there's no agreements reached on a lot of really important issues. I mean, what are we going to do about e-commerce? What are we going to do about the fact that we're depleting the oceans with fish subsidies? What are we going to do about making sure trade is contributing to climate change? What are we going to do about these issues around trade and labor and, and forced labor and so, on and on and on? No new agreements in that space. And as a result, the perception is that, you know, people are questioning, what's the point of having a rules-based trading system? If the two largest trading countries in the world, the United States and China, are going to have a trade war that is largely being fought outside of the realm of the WTO, what's the point? Uh, and so, and what's the point of the WTO if it can't get serious about contributing to the fight of climate change or global health or other things? So uh, I, I think Judy is exactly right. Um, and there really is a concern about whether, when, and in what forum this sort of competition between the United States and China is best. I don't want to say litigated, but is best sort of resolved or, or whether we can establish some new or altered rules of the road that, that more broadly um, the rest of the world can agree to. And if it doesn't take on board the concerns coming out of you know, Africa and the rest of Asia, then you know, we're not going to get there. So, I mean, there is a huge, huge push now, I think, to try to figure out where, when, and how do we establish some new rules of the road. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, Jude, picking up on that and twisting it a little bit, um, we have a question about uh, the role of regional blocks in Africa. So what role are they playing in trade, commerce, infrastructure development? Um, how, 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 how do they fit into this? So this, and, and, and you know, when President Trump was waging war against the international system, and, and basically undermining institutions that have been set up for, for this. In Africa, something different was happening. Uh, the continent was moving toward a single market through this Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. And the idea here is that a third of the countries in Africa are landlocked. And landlocked countries surrounded by resource poor countries, they're, they're often poor. And, and, and because of that, Africa as a destination of, of, of investment was sort of difficult because instead of dealing with one jurisdiction, you have 54 separate jurisdictions in smaller and smaller units. And so this idea was we're going to combine our economic power so that we become a $3 trillion market or economy instead of single one. And so that's the direction that is happening now. But even there, because one of the things that a Chinese foreign minister said was how to tie the AFCTA with the BRI. All right. So we're seeing like uh, even at that level, substantive engagement from the Chinese in, in terms of how to do that. And the argument they make is for you to build an integrated Africa, you need to build regional infrastructure. You need to connect transport links. You need to connect communication links. And we will provide that for you to be able to do that. So I don't think there is any segment of the African society that doesn't have some sort of substantive Chinese presence. I'm talking about subnational city level national, regional, uh, sub-regional, and regional level. So at every one of them, if the divide, if the defining question remains infrastructure, then you're going to turn to the partner most capable of providing that infrastructure. And more often than not, it has been the Chinese. So Thibault, Thibault Nagy, the former assistant secretary for African affairs, used to have this thing. He says that for many years, when the Africans heard a knock on the door, and they open it, it was a Chinese person standing there. Next time they hear a knock, I wanted to be an American standing there. That, that was the story. That, that's how he would say it. And so I think even at regional levels, there is still really, really substantive engagement from China there. Final thing I would say is that 
for the last 32 years, every single year, the first international trip that a Chinese foreign minister makes is to Africa. They've done it for 32 years. This current Chinese foreign minister has made 17 trips to Africa. When the US introduces Africa policy, there wasn't even anyone present in Africa at the cabinet rank. Eight African heads of state was there. At some point, it is not just the substance, perception matters too. So I think it's important that if the US is gonna challenge China in this great power competition, then there has to be some sort of substantive output, especially in so far as Africa is concerned. That is a brilliant place to stop. Um, Jude, Jennifer, thank you so much. You have both been phenomenal. Um, I think that this is a real wake up call and um, I, I truly appreciate all your insights, your passion, the work you're doing. Thank you to the audience, really fantastic questions. Um, thank you. Our next briefing, do we have this up here, Brian? Um, is illiberalism on the rise. So what history, um, what history teaches us or what history tells us. So it will be with Dr. Sherry Berman. Please do register. They're free and open to everyone. Share with a colleague, share with a friend. Um, and thank you all for joining us, uh, especially Jennifer and Jude. You, you've been phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you very Have much. Great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.